And Lord, we ask for the power of the Holy Spirit upon the Word of God, that as it is taught and preached, it would effect, Lord, what you desire to do today in the hearts of these precious people that have come to worship you. So may it be so. May it be done for Jesus' sake. Amen. We come today to one of the great events in redemptive history. We come to the birth of the forerunner of the Messiah, John the Baptist. And you'll recall that when John's father, Zacharias, an elderly man, was ministering in the temple and he was uh, offering incense before the Lord, the angel Gabriel appeared to him and he said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for behold, your wife Elizabeth will conceive and bear a son and you shall name him John. And he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He'll drink no wine or liquor. He will turn many of the sons of Israel to the Lord their God. In fact, he'll be like Elijah. He'll come on the spirit and power of Elijah. And he will do a great work and prepare. He'll make a people prepared for the coming of the Lord. So Zechariah saw this vision. He saw the angel. He heard the word. And he didn't know what to do with it. And he says, well, how will I know this for certain? Because I'm an old man and my wife is advanced in years. So rather than believing the word of God, he doubted God. And the angel said, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God. And I've come to declare this good news to you. But because you didn't believe the word of God, behold, you're going to be struck dumb today until the day these things are fulfilled. And that's exactly what took place. He came out of the temple and he couldn't speak. In fact, he couldn't hear. He had to communicate with signs to the people. Fast forward six months, the very same angel appears to Elizabeth's relative Mary. And he comes into her and he says, Hail, favored one, the Lord is with you. And she didn't know what to make of this. She was deeply perplexed and she kept pondering as to what these things might be. And the angel said to her, you have found favor with God. And behold, you are going to conceive and bear a son. And his name will be Jesus. And God will give you the throne of his father David. And you're going to reign over his kingdom forever. And your kingdom will have no end. He's speaking there about the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And Mary said, well, how can this be? Because I'm a virgin and I've never known a man. And so he explained that the Holy Spirit would come upon her. The power of the Most High would overshadow her. And that holy child that would be born of her would be called the Son of God. And he said, not only that, but your relative Elizabeth has conceived in her old age and she's in her sixth month. And so in a hurry, she got up and went to her relative's house because she just couldn't wait to talk with her about the beautiful thing that God has, was going to do for her. And when she came into the room, she greeted her and at that moment... Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and began to prophesy. She cried out with a loud voice and she said, Blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. For when I heard your greeting, the babe in my womb leaped for joy. How could it be that the mother of my Lord would come to me? And then that causes Mary just to break forth in song. Uh, all these people are being filled with the Holy Spirit. You've got um, Elizabeth filled with the Spirit, speaking about the glorious things of God. Mary filled with the Holy Spirit, begins to exalt the Lord. And then we come to the next stage in this whole thing. Three months later, Mary goes home, the baby John is born, and then on the eighth day, uh, Elizabeth and, and Zacharias take John to be circumcised according to the law. And all their friends and relatives are there, and they get ready to circumcise him and the, the friends that are waiting around say, well, what are you going to call the boy? Surely it'll be Zacharias after the father. And the mother says, no, no, we're going to call him John. John? Why would you call him John? You have no relatives called John. Let's ask the father. Maybe he'll tell us what the name should be. So they, they asked Zacharias, what should we call this boy? And Zacharias writes on a tablet, his name is John. He doesn't say his name shall be called John because Zacharias had no right to name the child. God had already named this boy. 
God told him through the angel Gabriel that his name was to be called John. And so out of obedience to the word of God, he says his name is John and immediately his tongue is loosed and he begins speaking in praise of God. And that is what we have in verses 68 to 79, a beautiful prophecy uttered by Zacharias. See, as soon as he disbelieved God's word, he was struck dumb. As soon as he believed it and acted on it, he was loosed like, like a dam being broke. I mean, think about it. For nine months, he hasn't been able to hear anything. He hasn't been able to speak anything. So he hasn't been able to communicate with people, except writing a few notes on a tablet. That's it. He's been shut up to God. Now, even though he can't speak with people, God can communicate to him. He and God can commune and fellowship with each other. And I'm sure that's what was going on for those nine months. Even though it was, in a sense, a judgment, in another sense, it was a blessing. So he, he must have been meditating on the message of the angel to him. He must have been med meditating on the words of Mary when she came and visited with them for those three months. And he must have been meditating on God's word. And it's like this lake is filling up bigger and bigger and bigger. And when his tongue is loose, the dam breaks and the fountains of the deep break forth. And he just spills out and begins proclaiming the wonderful works of God. And folks, that's what we want to study today. We want to study this prophecy of Zacharias in verses 68 to 79. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. This is called the Benedictus. Now, when Mary uttered her song of praise, that's called the Magnificat. These are both Latin terms. Magnificat for magnify. Mary says, my soul doth magnify the Lord. So it's called the Magnificat. Zechariah says, blessed be the Lord God of Israel. So the Latin word for blessed is Benedictus. So we have those words that have been given to these two prophecies uttered. What I want you to see as we get started here is that you would have thought Zacharias would have spoke of his baby boy when his tongue is loosed, right? He's so proud. He's been waiting for years. In fact, he'd been praying and praying and praying, God, please give us a child. And God had not seen fit to answer that prayer until finally when it was too late for them by the ordinary means to have a child, God supernaturally gave them the baby. You would have thought that he would be so excited and so happy that he would speak about John. But that's not what he does. Yes, there are two verses devoted to John. Verse 76 and 77. But there are ten verses devoted to the Messiah that God is going to bring into the world. And that's really where the floodlight shines. John never wants to be the center stage. John, John's motto is, I must decrease. He must increase. I just want to hide myself in the shadow of the cross. Let's lift up Jesus. Behold the Lamb of God. He's the one who takes away the sins of the world. That was John's spirit. And that's what his father's spirit was here as the Spirit of God uttered this prophecy through him. Now the key, I think, that unlocks these verses is found in verse 78. There we read, Because of the tender mercy of our God. I've entitled this message, The Tender Mercy of Our God. I think that throws light on every aspect of this prophecy that Zacharias uttered. Mercy is one of the dominant themes of Luke chapter 1. Let me show you that. Luke chapter 1, verse 50. Mary said, And his mercy is upon generation after generation to those who fear him. Verse 54, she said, He has given help to Israel, his servant, in remembrance of his mercy. Or verse 58, her neighbors and her relatives heard that the Lord had displayed his great mercy toward her, and they were rejoicing with her. Verse 72, to show mercy toward our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. Verse 78, because of the tender mercy of our God. Now, mercy is very closely aligned with the word grace. Mercy and grace are synonyms, although there is some distinction between those two words. Grace is God's undeserved favor. Mercy also has the added connotation of compassion to people who are in great misery. That's what mercy is. God having compassion on those who are in great misery. In fact, the literal rendering here in the Greek is because of the bowels of compassion of our God. 
That's why God forgave them. That's why God redeemed them. That's why God saved them. And that's why God illumined them. That's why he does everything that he does through this Messiah. It's because the bowels of his compassion yearned to save and to redeem and to love and to welcome a people to himself. So we're going to focus on the tender mercy of our God. And we're going to do that by noticing this morning three things about the Messiah. The person of Christ, the performance of Christ, and then the people of Christ. So let's look first of all at the person of Christ. What does our text say in verse 68? Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited us. Wait a minute. Jesus is the one that visited us. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, because he has visited us. Who visited us? The Lord God of Israel. Of Israel. I believe this is one of the strongest texts to support the idea that Jesus is God, the deity of Christ in the Bible. It's so clear. The Lord God of Israel has come down and visited his people. Now, think about that for just a minute. Over in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, Matthew quotes Isaiah 7, 14 which says that the virgin, behold, the virgin shall be with child, and she shall bear a son, and they shall call his name, what? Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. That's Jesus' name, God with us. I don't know how the cults can say Jesus is not God. On, when you see texts like these that are so clear and so pointed, the Bible teaches that Almighty God has visited His people. Now, think about that concept for a minute. God wasn't content just to send a messenger, was He? Now, He has sent human messengers. We call those prophets. The prophets have come. They have given messages to God's people. God wasn't just content to send an angelic messenger. He sent Gabriel twice. Once to Zacharias, once to Mary. He wasn't content with that. God was only content to come himself in the person of Jesus Christ to visit his sinful, rebellious creatures and to bring to them redemption, salvation, forgiveness, and illumination. What a blessed thought. Can you think of the condescension of God? Let's think about who this is that came to visit this planet. This is God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. You know, we look up into the sky and see the universe, and we cannot even grasp the immensity, the vastness of that universe that God has made. And was that difficult for God to do? He just spoke the words, and it appeared. Think about the, the greatness, the all power, the wisdom, the sovereignty, the holiness of this God. And this was the one who's come to visit not perfect, righteous, and holy creatures, sinful and rebellious people like you and I. So God condescended to come down, 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 down. It's sort of like one of us deciding, okay, here's some maggots over here. They're going to be exterminated. I've got to go help them. I will volunteer to become a maggot so that I can tell them how they can escape the exterminator who's coming onto the lawn today. But Jesus didn't become a worm in the likeness of sinful flesh. He didn't just become a human being for a day or a few hours. The Bible says that he became human forever. He's, a, he's the God-man. He reigns at the right hand of the throne of God. He still has assumed a human nature. That nature has been eternally wedded to a divine nature. He will for always and forever be the God-man. Isn't that an amazing concept? That God would be willing to partake of our nature forever? But that's what we celebrate at Christmas. That's what the incarnation's all about. God has visited his people. My favorite Christmas hymn is the one by... Uh, Charles Wesley, Christ by highest heaven adored, Christ the everlasting Lord, 
You know, I used to hear these hymns, these Christmas carols, and they would go right over my head. They had no meaning at all. The, the first Christmas I was born again, I thought, what in the world happened to those carols? They're infused with meaning. I, I love them. Christ by highest heaven adored, Christ the everlasting Lord. Late in time, behold him come, offspring of a virgin's womb, veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. Hail the incarnate deity. Pleased is man with men to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. So the person of Christ is the Lord God of Israel. That's who has come to visit his people. Now let's look at the performance of Christ. There's four things that he came to do according to the prophecy of Zacharias. Number one, he came to redeem his people. Look at verse 68. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited us and accomplished redemption for his people. He has visited us and accomplished redemption for his people. Now, did you notice he put it in the past tense? Now, that's kind of strange, isn't it? Jesus wasn't even born yet. He hadn't lived a sinless life. He hadn't gone to the cross. He hadn't been raised from the dead. How could it possibly be true that he has already visited us and accomplished redemption for us? Well, the way I see that is that speaking by the Holy Spirit, He's speaking from a divine perspective. This was the sovereign purpose of God. And folks, when God sovereignly purposes to do something, it's going to happen. God can put it in the past tense because it's as good as done. It's a done deal. It's like Romans 8.30. Whom he justified, these he also glorified. Wait a minute, he justified me, but I'm not glorified yet. Well, you will be. <laughs> you will be. You most certainly will be. Because that's one of the sovereign purposes of our God. So here we're told, he will come and he has accomplished redemption for his people. Now let's think about that word redemption. The word redemption means to set free by paying a price. Set free by the paying of a ransom or paying of a price. And I believe in the back of Zacharias' mind as he's prophesying, he couldn't help but think of the children of Israel right now. Remember, God visited the children of Israel. He came down. He heard their groanings and their sighings. He knew uh, the bondage and the misery that they were under as they faced the cruel taskmasters of Egypt and the Pharaoh who was lording it over them. And he was demanding that they make so many bricks in a day and then they had to go out and get the straw and make the bricks. There's no way they could do it. And then they were whipped if they didn't keep up with their quotas. And they just cried out to God to deliver them. Well, God came down. He revealed himself to a man named Moses. Moses went to the Pharaoh, and through a whole series of events, Moses kept saying to the Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go that they may serve me. And God sent plague after plague after plague. And then finally, there was a final plague in which God decided this is the one that is going to actually redeem, set my people free from this cruel tyrant. And the price that was paid on that night was a spotless, unblemished lamb, one year old, in the prime of life. This lamb was to be slaughtered. His blood was to be covered over the doorposts, the lintel of that door. The people were to go inside that house and they were together to eat that lamb, to consume the whole thing. Redemption, to set free by the payment of a price. A lamb had to die. Innocent life had to be taken. Blood had to be shed. When the destroying angel came over the land that day, he smote, he killed every firstborn in the land of Egypt that didn't have the blood over the door. The price was blood. The price was life. But God redeemed his people, didn't he? That was the, the event that caused the Pharaoh to finally release his people so that they were able to exit the land of Egypt, and to be free so that they could go and serve God. So the first picture is a picture of a bunch of people who are captives, who are enslaved to an evil tyrant. God comes to a bunch of people like that, and he releases them. He releases the captives. Now, who is our captive? Or who is our captor, I should say? 
Who's the one who keeps us enslaved? Satan does. And you could say in another sense, our own sin. We're born into this world enslaved to sin, under the dominion and power of sin. We're also slaves to Satan, according to 2 Timothy 2.26, held captive by him to do his will. And folks, we had no power to free ourselves. Think about those, those people who are being held hostage by an enemy general. And they're in this concentration camp, and they've got soldiers lined up around the perimeter. There's no way they can possibly escape. They're stuck there until they die, unless someone more powerful than that general comes and disarms him. Well, that's what King Jesus has done. He's redeemed his people through the blood of his cross. So, the first picture we have is a bunch of enslaved captives. The second thing we notice in Zacharias' prophecy is that he not only will redeem his people, he'll save his people. The word salvation keeps appearing in this chapter. Take a look with me at verse 69. And has raised up a horn of salvation for us. Verse 71. Salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. Verse 74. To grant us that we being rescued, which is just a synonym for saved, to grant us that we being saved or rescued from the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear. Verse 77. To give to his people the knowledge of salvation. So we're told many times in this chapter that the purpose of this one who God is sending into the world, which is his own son, the purpose is not only to redeem captives, it's to rescue the perishing. Because that's what salvation means. The picture is not just of a bunch of hostages in a prison camp with guards around it. The picture is that evil general taking out ten every morning, lining them up before a firing squad, squad and shooting them dead. You see, our ultimate and eternal destruction was imminent. We needed rescuing. It's the picture of that two-year-old child who's in a burning house. The house is burning down around the child and, and the fireman races up the ladder and he snatches the child and brings him out of the burning house. He saved the child. He rescued the child. He delivered the child from perishing. That's what God has done for his people. That's what the Ma Messiah was called into the world to do. He's called to save. Now, of course, just like Satan is the one holding us hostage, Satan is also the one that we mean, need to be saved from. We need to be saved from his power. Scripture tells us, while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Think about that word helpless. It's not that you had a little bit of power, and you could add a little bit of your strength to God's, and the, together the two of you could work this deal out. No. You were helpless. You couldn't lift your finger to help yourself in your situation. You were dead in your transgressions and sin. You were lost and you couldn't find your way. You were going to suffer imminent eternal destruction because of your own sin and rebellion to God. And when you and I were in that condition because of the tender mercy of our God, He not only came and freed you, He came and saved you from destruction. Now, in our passage today, we see two of the attributes of Christ that come forth as we look at His salvation. I want you to notice them with me. He says in verse 68, He's raised up a horn of salvation for us. First, we see the power of Christ. Because this word horn isn't talking about a trombone or a trumpet. It's talking about the great horn on an animal, a beast, like an ox or a bull. Or if you happen to be African, a rhinoceros. A great symbol of strength and power and victory. This is what the animal uses to defend itself from its enemies. And sometimes an animal will use that horn to actually destroy its enemies, to kill them. I remember seeing a YouTube video of... Um, of this dead elephant and there were there were big holes gashed in the side of this elephant the size of tusks and another elephant had got into a fight with this 
elephant and just crushed him, pierced him with his tusks right into the side of his body until he was dead. So the horn is, is an emblem of strength and power. Our salvation was a powerful salvation because we were helpless. We needed an infinite power because we were held by a foe stronger than ourself. We could not break free. We could not release ourselves from his grasp. You were held by sin. Now just think about your enemy of sin for a minute. Sin is an, a radical, pervasive principle that all of us are born with. It has infected every aspect of you. Your mind, your emotions, your will, your thoughts, your actions, your attitudes. There's not a single day in your life that you don't struggle in one way or another with this principle of sin that you're born with. And we can't get rid of it. How, how, would you love to just get rid of sin for a day? <laughs> to see what it's like to live without the principle of sin? Man, well, that'd be wonderful. But we can't do it, can we? Jesus can. There is coming a day, a final day, when sin will be gone forever. He's going to root that out of us. We're going to be glorified. And in the meantime, He has destroyed the penalty of sin, and He has overcome even the dominion, the power of sin. He is a mighty Savior. Isaiah 63, 1 says that Jesus is mighty to save. This is a reference to Jesus when it talks about He's raised up a horn of salvation. We don't often think about Jesus being a horn of salvation, but He is. He's a powerful God who's come into the world to save you. Thank God that He's powerful, because we need a powerful Savior. But not only is He a powerful Savior, He's a faithful Savior. Look at the next three verses, starting in verse 70. As He spoke by the mouth of His holy prophets from of old, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy toward our fathers and to remember His holy covenant, the oath which He swore to Abraham our father. I'm going to pick out some words here. Holy prophets. As He spoke by the mouth of His holy prophets from of old. God spoke to prophets and it's coming true. The next word, our fathers. Verse 72. To show mercy toward our fathers. The fathers refers to the patriarchs. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. Those great men of old that were the heads of Israel. And then this one. To remember his holy covenant. The oath which he swore to Abraham our father. What did God swear to Abraham? He said, in you. Surely all the families of the earth will be blessed. He, made, he gave him an oath. He swore by himself because there was no one greater to swear by. In you, Abraham, all the families of the earth will be blessed. What we're seeing here is that God keeps his promise. He gave a word through the prophets. He kept it. He gave his word to the fathers. He fulfilled it. He gave them his holy covenant. He came and fulfilled that covenant in Christ. He made an oath, a promise, and he kept his word. Not one word that God has given to his people will ever fall to the ground. It is sure and it is certain. So the salvation of Jesus Christ is powerful and it is faithful because it fulfills all the promises and covenants and oaths that God has given beforehand. Jesus came to fulfill what God had said. So the first picture is that of a, some poor, pitiable people being held hostage by an evil tyrant. The second one is day after day after day, this evil tyrant lining them up and killing them, and all the rest being in imminent peril of dying any day. The third one is he will forgive his people. He not only redeems his people and f saves his people, he will forgive his people. Verse 77. To give to his people the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. He redeems. He saves. He forgives. The way he saves is by forgiving us of our sins. Now what does it mean to be forgiven? Let's try to get to the root of that idea, that word. To be forgiven means that your debt has been canceled. It's been remitted. 
legally. The debt's gone. It can never be brought up again in a court of law. Someone else has paid your debt, and so the debt has been paid in full. You no longer owe anything because it was paid on your behalf. That's what Jesus Christ came into the wor world to do, to cancel debts. Folks, what if you owed God a dollar for every time you committed a sin? How much would you owe him? <laughs> do you, do you, think you, you think that you'd be able to come up with enough money to pay off that debt? Never. Never, in a million years. We are spiritually bankrupt, aren't we? We can't pay that debt off. It's hopeless if we look to ourselves to try to provide a payment for sin. Remember, Jesus told us to pray, forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. So sin is a debt to God. It's a debt to His justice. We have violated God's justice. We have rebelled numerous times, again and again and again, and each one of those is accumulating this debt to God. And we stand before Him on Judgment Day and we say, Lord, I can't pay it. There's nothing I can do to ever repay that kind of debt. That's in the billions. That's in the trillions. And here am I, a poor sinner. I've got nothing to recommend myself to you. I have no righteousness of my own that you can accept. Lord, I'm undone. And all of us would be absolutely undone were it not for the Lord Jesus Christ who came for the purpose of forgiving His people of their sins. Canceling their debt to God. You see, forgiveness is free to us. But it's not free to God. Someone had to pay the debt, didn't they? And Jesus voluntarily undertook that debt. And when he died on the cross, he said, it's finished. It's paid in full. The debt has been canceled for those who are in the Son. Are you in Christ today? Are you united to Christ? Is he your Savior, your Lord, your everything, your treasure? Then your debt's canceled then you are saved. Then you are redeemed. And there is one more. There is one more. Not only does he redeem, save, and forgive, he also illumines his people. Look at verse 78. Because of the tender mercy of our God with which the sunrise from on high will visit us, to shine upon those who sit in darkness in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. He talks about Jesus being the sunrise from on high. The sunrise from on high. What an interesting description of Christ. Now, what does a sunrise do? Brings a new day, doesn't it? It brings light into a dark world. That's what Jesus came to do. Malachi 4.2 says that the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. A reference to this Messiah. Jesus said himself, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And here we're told that he shines upon those who sit in darkness in the shadow of death to guide their feet into the way of peace. So this is another picture. We've seen a picture of hostages, a picture of people getting ready to go before the firing squad. We've seen a picture of people that are just guilty and... and um, they have this debt beyond calculation. Well, the fourth picture is a picture of some travelers. They're on a trip, and they're going through the woods, and they've lost their way. And they're trying to find their way out of the woods, and they can't. They're just lost as a goose. <laughs> and darkness finally descends, and there they are in the complete blackness of night. And they know that there's cliffs, because they saw them when it was day. There's cliffs all over the place. And there's wild beasts, there's bears, and there's lions in this wilderness. And so they huddle together, and they shiver in the cold, and just waiting for morning light, hoping beyond hope that somehow they can make it through the night. Whenever they hear a rustling in the leaves, they tremble for fear. That's another picture of us. Not only were we enslaved, not only were we perishing, not only were we guilty, but the Bible says we were lost. We were lost in utter darkness. Now the people that Jesus came to originally, the people of Israel, they were in ignorance. The blackness of their own ignorance of God. 
What I mean by that is they really didn't know certain things that we take for granted. We, we have our New Testament and we read and we understand what happens after death. But to them it was fuzzy and shadowy. It, they knew that they went into Sheol, but that's about it. And they really didn't understand how a person could be made right with God. They had this fuzzy, shadowy idea that had something to do with a sacrifice. An animal had to die so that they wouldn't. But that's about as far as it went. But here, when Jesus comes into the world, he casts light on his people. And he shows them spiritual truth. And he gives them the knowledge of himself. And all of a sudden, they go from darkness to light. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 says that God has shown his light into our hearts that we might perceive the light of the knowledge of the glory of Christ. God shown a supernatural, heavenly light into your soul. If you're a Christian, he gave you light where there was only confusion and ignorance before. And he helped you to see things that were true and real. Remember Jesus said, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Eternal life is to know God. Eternal life means you're brought out of darkness into light. You're no longer lost anymore. You've been found. You're safe in the arms of that shepherd. You can see now. At once we were spiritually blind. Satan has blinded the minds of the unbelieving that they might not see the light of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Satan has blinded people. But thank God we have a champion. We have a deliverer. We have a greater than Samson. One who can take Satan and break his back and take the blinders off of his people's eyes so they see his glory and they rejoice with exceeding joy. That's what happens when God saves somebody. Christ is unveiled to them. Christ is revealed to them. We talked earlier about this man who received Christ. And what a joy that is. If he truly did receive Christ, he's a new person. Amen. Behold, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are gone. Everything is, has become new. He has been united to Jesus Christ. But God being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions and sins, he made alive together with Christ. That, my friends, is salvation. And nothing less. And if that doesn't happen, it doesn't matter how many confessions we make, how many aisles we walk down, how many times we say, God loves me, you're deceived unless that's happened. Unless that heavenly light is shining, shown into your soul and you've been made alive from the dead. Salvation is a spiritual resurrection. It's light coming into a dark life. Thank God he came to illumine his people. It's like at one time we were in a, a, a closet. We've got this closet at home. And if you close the door behind you, you can't see a thing. Pitch black. It's like a guy going into his closet, closing the door and opening up a map. Because he wants to find out how to get to Modesto. So he's looking at the map. He can't see a thing. The map doesn't do him any good. At one time, you may have read the Bible. You may have gone to church. It's like reading a map in the dark. You, you can't make heads or tails of it. It doesn't make sense. But when I, I have a friend who calls it flipping the switch. <laughs> when you're regenerated, God flips that switch. Light comes on. You see. Once I was blind, now I see. And Zacharias is prophesying that God's going to send a Messiah who's going to cause this to happen to his people. Okay, we've talked about the person of Christ and the performance of Christ. All because of the tender mercy, the bowels of compassion of our God. The people of Christ. First of all, who are they? Secondly, what will they do? Who are they? Well, I want you to notice verse 68 says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited us and accomplished redemption for who? His people. Christ's people. Christ has a people. Well, who are they? Is that everybody in the world? Is everybody in this world one of the persons of Christ? Is everybody going to be set free from their captivity? Is everybody going to be rescued from perishing? Is everybody going to have their debt canceled? Is everybody going to have light shown into their soul? No. On that final day, there's going to be two groups of people. 
the sheep, the saved, the goats, the lost. The sheep will go into eternal life. The goats will go into eternal punishment. Jesus said that there is a path that leads to life and few are those who find it. The minority in this world, I don't know how many, I don't know what the percentage is, but Jesus said few. It's not going to be most people. According to Jesus, it will be few. So, no, not everybody in this world is the people of Christ. Sometimes you hear people say, well, aren't we all God's children? I hear that all the time. No, <laughs> we're not. Unless you've been born again by the Holy Spirit, then you're one of his children. You can say, well, I'm a child of God in the sense that he created me, and that's the only sense. But not in the sense that he has redeemed you and regenerated you and is going to glorify you. That is reserved for his people. Now, let's see if we can divine these people. The Bible speaks about them as being his flock. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. The flock of God are the ones that Jesus purchased with his blood. They're called the church of God, the flock of God. They're called the bride of Christ. They're called the members of his body. They're called living stones being constructed into this new and living temple. These are the people of Christ that we're talking about. Now, notice it says his people. Why are they Jesus' people? Are they his people because he created them? Well, he did. He did create them, but that's not why they're his people. Because that would mean every person in the world is going to be redeemed, saved, forgiven, and illumined. And that's just not true. Are they his people because he has redeemed them? Well, at this point when Zacharias wrote the prophecy, Jesus hadn't even been born yet. He hadn't actually redeemed anyone. So no, I don't think it's because he created them or redeemed them. They are his people because God gave them to Jesus before the foundation of the world. Did you know that God gave a gift, a love gift to his son? There was a compact, an agreement between the members of the Trinity. The father chose out a group of people and said, Son, I am giving these people to you. They're your gift. They're your bride. It's like an arranged marriage. You know, sometimes you have these marriages arranged and the kids are one year old. Well, there was an arranged marriage. God arranged it. He said, These people are your bride. They will worship you for all eternity for what you have done for them. So I'm going to give them to you. In the Gospel of John, Jesus will say over and over, he'll refer to those the Father has given to him. All that the Father has given to me shall come to me. And the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. He says, I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I would lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. So all those the Father gave him, will come to Jesus, and all those that come to Jesus will never depart from Jesus, but he will raise them up and glorify them on the last day. They're given to Jesus by the Father before the world was made. Those are his people. Jesus came into the world for them, to search them out, to save them, to redeem them, to illumine them, to forgive them. So that's their identity. That's who they are. Now, second question is, what will they do? Once they're redeemed, saved, forgiven, and illumined, what are they going to do? Well, he gives us an answer to that question in our text. Verse 74 and 75. To grant us that we, being rescued from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him, all our days. He has redeemed, saved, forgiven, and illumined them for a purpose. What are they going to do, according to the text? They're going to serve him. They're going to serve him. You see, nobody gets to serve nobody. <laughs> Does anybody here remember Bob Dylan? He wrote a good song called, You Gotta Serve Somebody. It may be the devil, 
or it may be the Lord, but you got to serve somebody. And that's true. He was, he nailed it. That's absolutely true. There's nobody that's sort of in limbo and neutral where they don't serve anybody. Either you're serving Satan or you're serving Jesus Christ. That they might serve him. You see, God doesn't save a people so that they might serve themselves. So that they might indulge their lusts. Or so they might do whatever they feel like doing. God saves a people so that they will serve him as king and lord and master. If a person says, yeah, he, I've been saved. Well, are you serving Christ? No, I don't do that. I, I do what I want to do. Well, you know, you haven't been saved, sir. A saved person serves Christ, according to this text. And he does it three ways. He serves Christ fearlessly. He serves Christ righteously. And he serves Christ continually. First of all, he serves him fearlessly. Notice the text. To grant us that we being rescued from the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear. Now that's not saying that he serves him without fearing God. It's saying that he doesn't fear Satan. He doesn't fear sin. He doesn't fear death. He doesn't fear hell. He doesn't fear damnation. He doesn't fear judgment. But he does fear God. I think this brings us back to the children of Israel again. Remember when God redeemed them? Set them free? Well, Pharaoh changes his mind. And he calls his, his armies to go after them and chase after them. And there they are on the shores of the Red Sea. And Moses lifts up his staff and God splits the waters. And the people, probably a couple million of them, walk. They march through the Red Sea. And then God lowers the boom as the is, Egyptians start following them through the Red Sea. He lowers the boom. The waters come down and destroy them. And now they're able to serve God. How? Without fear. Because their enemy has been destroyed. And you and I don't have to fear Satan because his back has been broken. It's just a matter of time till he's cast into the lake of fire. He can't hurt the true child of God. He may tempt you. He may do all he can to get your uh, awareness away from Christ, but he can't damn you. You are safe in the arms of Jesus Christ. Death is something that we ought not be afraid of. Now, before you're saved, you ought to be afraid of death. But Jesus is the king over death. Death knows no terror for the, the true child of God. On your deathbed, I hope that you will look into the face of Christ. And you might be feeling some pain, and that may not be comfortable. But I hope you don't, aren't terrified of what you're going to. You, because you're going into the arms of your Savior. The one who visited this planet to redeem you to himself. You shouldn't be afraid either of the power of sin over your life. Now, you need to fight sin. You need to struggle sin. But sin will never overcome you to the place, if you're a true child of God, it won't overcome you to, to where you were like before you came to Christ. The dominion of sin has ended in the born-again child of God. Now, we struggle with it, don't we? We fight it. We fight sin. But sin will not conquer you. 1 John 5, verse 4 says, what is that that overcomes the world? Even our faith. If you have real faith, saving faith in Jesus Christ, you're going to overcome the world. You're going to overcome sin. You're going to overcome the attacks of Satan. And you're going to exit this world, go through the portal of death and into the arms of Christ. So, we are to serve him fearlessly. Secondly, we're to serve him righteously. He says, in holiness and righteousness. That's how we serve him. The child of God does not live like a child of the devil. If someone says, yes, I made a profession for Christ when I was 12, but you look at their life and they're committing fornication, they're living with their boyfriend, uh, you say, I'm sorry, but you're, you're deceived. Your profession is a false profession. If God really had saved you, the Spirit of God would have come in, and the Spirit's not going to let you go on living like this. You are going to be racked with guilt until you do something about it. He is going to discipline you. And folks, if you're in a place today where you're living in sin, and you're, you're not feeling guilt over that, and you're comfortable, that's a very, very terrible sign that you are not a child of God. Those whom God justifies, he sanctifies. 
every child. He scourges those whom he receives because he loves them. He loves them too much to let them go off into sin. So we serve God in holiness and righteousness. We serve God by killing sin. Romans 8.13 if by the Spirit you're putting to death the deeds of the body, you'll live. Well, what if you don't put to death the deeds of the body? You die. A Christian is one who, who fights sin, who kills it. He takes out the knife and he stabs it. He's serious about overcoming sin. And if you have no concern to overcome sin, something's wrong, my friend. These are the marks of the elect. They're marks of Christ's people, given to him from the foundation of the world. So they will serve him fearlessly. They will serve him righteously. They'll also serve him continually. He says, in holiness and righteousness, how long? All our days. You don't serve him for a few days and stop. If you've been born again by the Spirit, you serve the Lord all your days. You say, Brian, do you believe in once saved, always saved? Well, with some qualification, I do. I believe in once saved, always being saved. If God has saved you, He's always in the process of continually saving you from sin right now. And if He's not doing that, maybe you weren't saved to begin with. That's the telltale sign of whether the Spirit's in you. God is work in your life. Once saved, always in the process of being saved by the powerful work of the Spirit. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to do of His good pleasure. So work out your sanctification with fear and trembling. The Westminster Confession of Faith puts it like this. They whom God hath accepted in his beloved, effectually called and sanctified by his spirit, can neither totally nor finally fall away from the state of grace, but shall certainly persevere therein to the end and be eternally saved. I agree wholeheartedly with that confession, even though I'm not a Presbyterian. I think they did a good job on that one. Don't you? I love it. They won't either um, totally... Now, Christians can backslide. There can be lapses. True. But they won't totally fall away. And they won't finally, if you die in unrepentant sin, you weren't saved. Because you won't totally nor finally fall away. It's kind of like when we lived in Sonora, we would drive up to Pinecrest Lake. Debbie and one of, this is our, our little getaway. Friday afternoons, we'd go down and get a wrap and a mocha, and we'd head up to Pinecrest Lake. Beautiful, beautiful lake, uh, 30 minutes from Sonora. See, Sonora is 1,800 feet above sea level. Pinecrest Lake is 5,000. So to get from Sonora to Pinecrest Lake, you have to go up. But while you're making that trip up, at any given time, you can be going down a hill. You go up a hill, you go down a hill. You go up a hill, you go down a hill. And that's what the Christian life is like. We have our ups and our downs, don't we? But the general tenor and direction of your life is up. If God has called you, you're on a path to heaven. You're seeking God. Now, yes, you struggle with sin. Sometimes you fall into sin. David was a man who fell into sin, but God got him back, didn't he? God restored him. I want to encourage you that those who serve the Lord, they serve Him fearlessly, they serve Him righteously, and they serve Him continually. It's not a, a spurt and a start, but they serve Him from now on. They persevere unto the end where they see Him face to face. Now, are these blessings too good for you to believe? You say, my goodness, the, I cannot possibly believe that could, God could be so good. Those blessings are too good to be true. Why would Jesus do that for me? Is it because I was a little better than somebody over here? No, you were by nature a children of wrath even as the rest. Well, was it because of my free will then? No, you were held captive by Satan to do his will. You weren't free. Well, was it because you met God halfway and they didn't do that, but you did it? No. Because you were dead in your transgressions. You couldn't meet him anyway. It's because of his tender mercy. Tender mercy. It's not just mercy, folks. It's tender. Tender mercy. The word tender mercy means that he loves you. He cares for you. He pities you. 
in your great misery. And he acts on your behalf. He comes to you. He visited you. He lived for you. He died for you. He rose for you. He ascended to the right hand of God for you. He intercedes for you. And he's coming back for you. That's the tender mercy of our God. Lord, I pray that you would take this message and you'd do your work in the hearts of your sheep today. Edify your people, Lord. Make them strong in the gospel today, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.